Hello, everybody. Hi, so I know there was a land acknowledgement done earlier at the ribbon cutting, but especially because I'm not from this land, it feels kind of superficial for me to do that. But I was wondering if you could help introduce me to the land. And I was thinking that each one of you could at the same time, in a kind of polyphonic chaos, say one being, be it microbial, fungal, geological, folkloric, that you have a deep relationship with. So if you want to stand up, hoot, sing, please. Thank you. Thank you to St. John's. Thank you to this land. Thank you to everyone here. All right, can you hear me all right? Okay, wonderful. So my talk is called Myth and Mycelium. You have been on the water since the third tremor shook the island in early morning. The gods are walking across the land. Their footsteps unsettle the ocean. They have been in dispute since before your grandfather's time, and the, and the seer long predicted they would soon come to battle. Soon for the gods could be hundreds of years. But when the dogs began to howl this morning after the third tremor, you knew that the day had arrived. Again, the ocean roils, buckles. Your flimsy fishing boat wobbles beneath you. Against your throat, a knife point of sorrow reminds you of the girl who would not come. She called you a dreamer, tossed her auburn hair as she headed past you to care for the sheep in the field her family shares with yours. You could convince almost no one to come with you but your younger brother, Clumenos, who clings to the side of the boat, and the dogs, threadbare animals with eyes like embers. Three of them barked until you let them aboard. Now they press against you like a skin of fur. True, there have been tremors felt on the island before, but no one else in your village on Akrotiri believes these are more than the passing pad of a god's foot on his way to woo an unsuspecting mortal. And then it happens. The sea convulses with sound. The thrum of a thousand mountain-sized lyres all plucking the same chthonic note. The sky combusts. Or is it the ocean that explodes? The force arrives from above and below. One set of gods collides with another a vasculature of flame fractals out through violet ash, and thunderbolts pierce the sea again and again, setting it to a boil. The dogs are howling alongside you, and your brother is screaming. Where your home island used to be in the distance, a solid sheet of fire, the water beneath you begins to steam. You scream at your brother to row, to row, to row. You know in this battle that it does not matter which gods win. All the mortals, despite their rituals and allegiances, will lose. Vaporized into skin-tinged smoke, curled into ashen silhouettes left behind in gardens, kitchens, sacred grottos, consumed by monstrous walls of water. Whatever gods arrive next, will rest on the debris of an entire culture, an entire people, but perhaps you can make it. Perhaps you can carry your stories of the old gods in your breast to wash up on another island. Perhaps all it takes is one human seated with one story to keep alive the memory of the lost flowers, the recipes for mead, the ivy, the hymns to the horned gods, the honeybee goddesses, the drum beats to summon rain, the auburn-haired girl standing at the fence posts cutting the scythe of a smile into your heart. 
You pass through the bottleneck of a cultural extinction event. You live to tell the tale again and again of how the gods fought to anyone who will listen. Many sought, but not all were so close. You live in a culture of breath. All information, sacred, practical, ecological, is nested in stories so compelling you can't help but retell them to an audience. It will be almost a thousand years until someone will commit it to writing, and by then, it will be so dense that it will take a skilled listener to find you in the high drama of the gods. But there you are, your pair of eyes witness to the battle that ended the Bronze Age. Enshrined as Hesiod's Titanomachy, the Titans are defeated by the new pantheon of Olympians. But below the immortal's heavenly skirmish, you bobbed on your boat, watched an entire ocean burn, watched waves erase the wonders of Crete, inundate the palaces, turn to silt the open air labyrinths. You witness, remember, and encode in breath the day that Mount Terra erupted. In 1650 CE on the Aegean island of Terra, a volcano erupted with the force of 40 atomic bombs, leaving behind a ring of islands that would become the Santorini Caldera and sending a series of deadly tsunamis, pyroclastic density currents of boiling water, and earthquakes through the Mediterranean basin. It is estimated that in the hours following the eruption, tsunami after tsunami bombarded the island of Crete, destroying its naval force, decimating its exquisite palaces and killing hundreds of thousands of people. It is even theorized that the after effects of the explosion caused years of climate catastrophe in all the neighboring kingdoms. Deadly drought in modern day Palestine, crop failure in modern day Germany, and the natural phenomenon that might provide the, ex the basis for the exodus plagues in Egypt. While the disaster straddles the end of the Bronze Age, in the slow beginning of the Iron Age, it also sits between two pantheons, the Titans and the Olympians. Or, if we look deeper, earth-reverent partnership societies and dominating hero-worshipping hierarchical societies. Translated through the bottleneck of mass trauma, the snake goddesses of Crete become the Medusa monsters of Greek mythology. As I often quip, most monster myths were originally mother myths. From heaven and from Olympus, he came forthwith, hurling the lightning. The bold flute thick flew thick and fast from his strong hand together with thunder and lightning, whirling an awesome flame. The life-giving earth crashed around and burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all about. All the land seethed and ocean streams and the unfruitful sea, the hot vapor lapped round the earth-born titans. Flame unspeakable rose to the bright upper air, the flashing glare of the thunder, stone, and lightning, blinding their eyes for all that there were strong. It is now generally agreed by historians, geologists, and archeologists alike, that while the theogony is articulated as myth, Describing the emergence of one pantheon from the old it may also provide an accurate description of a real disaster. Science historian Mott Green notes that the deafening rumbles and sounds of battles record the harmonic tremors of earthquakes just prior to the eruption. The reference Hesiod makes to long waves describe the island-consuming tsunamis following directly afterwards. In many cases, Indigenous folklore and myths precede science in their accurate documentation of ecological phenomena, notably in Aboriginal stories about devil devils descending from the heavens and creating massive craters. It was only after following these stories that the Henbury craters were identified and iron slugs were pull pulled from the ground, confirming a meteorite strike. The Pitt River Nation also known as the Achumawi, have a cosmology that dates the universe at 10,000 billion years old. 
This myth far predates the material reductionist conclusion that the universe's lifespan is indeed close to that estimation. What if, as read modern readers, we have forgotten how to read myth? Not as a fantasy, but as an actual Noah's Ark of ecological and practical knowledge, crafted as carefully as possible to carry many beings, many seeds of wisdom across the boiling oceans of collapse and the floodwaters of the future? What if myth was a way of asking questions of our environments and getting back durable and accurate information? We have been dialoguing for tens of thousands of years and receiving back relevant data. Nine red lines etched on a flake of stone in the Blombos Cave in South Africa have recently pushed back human art making to at least 73,000 years ago, 30,000 years earlier than the earliest known abstract drawings in Europe. Mythologist John Kane calls this dialogue with the earth, be it spoken or drawn or sculpted, myth telling. We interact with our larger ecosystem, our larger shared body, through this polytemporal, multi-species dialogue. We ask questions and receive answers, and we ask again. The key is that this experience is not one-sided. It is curious, organismic, relational, and interrogative. What we learn through this dialogue becomes a type of communication we call myth. Prehistory is a term used to explain the time that came before literacy, but almost all of human history is prehistory. Almost all of human myth predates literacy, stretching back 750,000 years to the time when hominids migrated out of Africa into Europe and Asia. While the first voices and songs and tales have not reached the seashell curvature of our ears, we still have access to incredible material culture preserved in caves and statuettes and figurines. In these earliest images across continents, we begin to notice some important themes. First, beginning around 20,000 years ago, there is the veneration of a goddess figure in varying physical forms, but with a consistent connection to animals and the moon, from Lake Baikal in Siberia all the way down to the Pyrenees. These statuettes and figures are made of ivory and stone and bone and are often etched with abstract patterns that become increasingly associated with partnership nature reverent cultures. Chevrons, spirals, leaves, nets, zigzags, circles. But I do not seek to enshrine an anthropocentric divine even though it has been deeply important to recover the feminine as sacred, we must realize the sacred is bigger than human dualisms. The most striking theme of prehistoric art is not, in fact, goddesses. It is the very absence of human beings, or straight-bodied humans in general. In fact, when we do have images of humans, they are less human and more verb, more <laughs> animal. They are something we would call a theriomorph. Theriomorph, and I know many of you will actually know the Greek I'm talking about here, which is cool. Um, theriomorph comes from the Greek therion for beast and metamorphon, meaning to change shape. It is often used to describe deities that have the ability to shape shift or who display human animal hybridity. Um, I want to summon a little ivory theriomorph figure. So it has the head of a male lion and the body of a man. The lion man is 40,000 years old, found in the Stadel Cave in Germany, just two days before the outbreak of the Second World War. His body is lustrously worn, bearing the mark of tender caresses. He has been touched to gleaming, a divine made for your hands, not for your head. Then, of course, there is the famous trough fair shaman, 13,000 years old, found in a cave in France. I call him the spirit worker, so we don't take, take that word. Um, this is the Trawfair spirit worker. He has owl eyes, horns. He has a very erect member. <laughs> he has human legs. He has a tail, 
Um, fur, he is very in process. Um, <laughs> you know, he, the, the beginning of transness is right here. Okay, and that's my gender, is trough rare, spirit worker. Okay. <laughs> At first we gaze with awe. This is one of the earliest representations of imaginative thinking. He is proof that his human makers could imagine and make something that did not exist in their ordinary environs. They could respond to the world creatively and add back in something truly novel. But although this interpretation is neat and seems to put a nice stake in the river of human evolution, designating a spot where we became creative self-reflective beings, I don't think it totally does justice to what we're seeing. I want to offer that what we're seeing is actually a deeply profound type of myth-making that is dialoguing, not with fantasy, but with deep time and with biological truth. We are so enculturated with Eurocentric epistemologies that we forget that for most of human history, we have been speaking with our environments and receiving back communications with extraordinarily relevant information. That data wasn't quantitative with our Western tools of measurement. Our tool of measurement was our bodies, our intuition, our dreams, and our relational webs that, like spider webs, could catch compelling beings and important ideas. This information coming from the environment couldn't be put in a box or labeled, but it didn't make it any less accurate. Modern medicine today is in many ways just backtracking, extracting, and reappropriating the botanical knowledge indigenous people have been holding in their myths for millennia. Poet and translator Robert Bringhurst proposes that myth can be seen as an alternative science. Both science and myth seek to understand the natural world. While a scientist quantifies the ele elements, the myth teller personifies them. So, what if we can look at these figures, these theriomorphs, as being highly accurate representations of our evolutionary past as animals? What if deeper even than that, we saw these blended beings as representative of the origins of our very selves? Our bodies today are the product of an ancient bacterial merger. Around 2.7 billion years ago, free living prokaryotes melted into one another, cannibalized inc incompletely, <laughs> um, to form the mitochondria and organelles of the cells that build our bodies today. And we can even see the anarchic cross species collaboration of the lion man and the trough frere theriomorph in the depths of our belly buttons reminding us of our flesh rhizome tying us once to another body, to a womb. Wombs are, in fact, possible because of viruses, a retrovirus that 200 million years ago invaded the bodies of proto-mammals, teaching them how to develop the protein syncytin that creates the syntrophoblast layer, the placenta. These wombs are only possible because of an ancestor that learned also how to take the ocean and its eggs into its own body when climatological pressures shifted it onto dry land. 340 million years ago, mammals, birds, lizards, all slide back into the same shared amphibious tetrapod bowl. Cassinaria kitty, resembling a small, lithe lizard. These ancient amphibious ancestors created portable oceans so they could gestate their children on dry land. Wombs gesture to our symbiotic saltwater origins. You are still an oceanic being, a hybrid. Your eyes and ears and sense of taste all developed in a liquid embrace. So I ask, do you look at thousands of years of theriomorphic beings as fanciful primitivism? Or do we realize that they represent a profound and intimate dialogue with deep time and with our evolutionary lineage of kin? This lineage of theriomorphs continues for thousands of years and across many different landscapes and cultures. Most intact traditions of spirit workers point towards the importance of cross-species relationship 
in visionary experiences that involve inhabiting the minds of animals. These theriomorphs, by virtue of their interspecies bodily existence, have information on how to sustainably live within a web of relationships, how to grow and eat food while tending the earth these beings are born from, how to honor the ancestors, human and more than human. All of this requires a mycelial flexibility, an ability to flow between forms and between species, to accept interstitial intelligence and to celebrate hybridity. Dionysus, with his bullhorns, his snakes and vegetation, is a direct rhizomatic continuation of this ancient type of intuition that biological and sacred novelty arrive through anarchic mergers, intracorporeality. Category violation, it turns out, isn't the aberration. It is the norm, and it is the very basis for most of life. It is the biological ground for the greatest evolutionary leaps. My favorite mythic metaphor, and the one that guides all of my mythic explorations, comes from such a collaboration. Here, we have the first underworld myth. Well before Inanna descended into the underworld. Well before Hades absconded with Persephone. Some 416 million years ago, plants made it onto dry land, but they did not yet have roots. Luckily enough, fungi were already skilled soil dwellers. Fungi are at least a billion years old. These early plants learned to have roots from these early mycorrhizal systems in the soil, depending on the fungi to keep them plugged into nutrients and place for millions of years before the two developed a converged evolution, creating lignin-based woody roots that mutualistically paired with mycorrhizal fungal systems. Still, to this very day, 90% of plants depend on mycorrhizal connections in the soil. So everything you see outside, the landscape, everything you ate today, every perfume you smelt <laughs> is the product of that particular intrabodily cross-species underworld trip. As forest ecology has developed, we see that it is this web of collaboration between fungi and vegetation and bacteria and dead matter that acts as the connective tissue between beings, creating delicately synchronized trophic waves of decay, blooming bacterial biomes, released minerals, and soil regeneration. Just like fungi taught plants how to root into the soil, so do myths teach us how to root into relationship with our ecological and social landscapes. They seek to express ultimate truths with personified elementals. They narrativize a deep understanding of our connection to more than human timescales. Fungal systems are constituted by thread-like mycelial systems below ground. Do they look like crochet? <laughs> you know, those mushrooms you see are just these reproductive flourishes of much larger systems below ground. They have no predetermined body plan. So they become a map of relationships wherever they grow. So their body becomes an ode to the relationships around them. It becomes like a, a statue, a piece of art. They branch and fork and fuse to constellate the connective network of other species and beings. I like to say that just as when you pour fungi into an ecosystem, it becomes a map of relationships, so should your stories your art, your myths, pour themselves into your web of kinship, becoming a map of your ecology of relationships. Fungi are maps of ecosystems, and myths should also represent webs of relatedness rather than a single species or narrative perspective. But we are living in a strange time now, when most of our myths are deracinated, uprooted. We think we have myths, but really, these stories are like house plants, cut off from the mycorrhizal complexity of the soil and therefore unable to refruit as something freshly adapted to our current environmental conditions and social circumstances. Robert Bringhurst explains, because mythologies and science alike aspire to be true, they are perpetually under revision. 
both lapse into dogma when the revision stops. Revision is decay. It is the acknowledgement that most of the work happens under the ground. Dionysus understands that he must be a different mushroom in Crete than he will be in Thrace. Myths must have root systems they can think, sink back into to revitalize the soil and to reemerge with the particular magic suited for this age of ecological chaos and societal collapse. A good myth is one that keeps moving, keeps traveling, keeps connecting, that rides the waves of breath and enters into another body <laughs> where it can be digested, adapted, and then retold. Milman Perry revolutionized classical studies and our ideas about orality when in 1928, he proved that Homer's Odyssey and Iliad had originally been composed to travel as oral epics and then were committed much later on to writing. Perry showed that the repetitions and structures in Homer indicated an oral text constructed out of themes, stock epithets, plot formulas, and standardized scenes that allowed for it to be more easily committed to memory and verbally adapted for specific performances. He showed that every distinctive feature of Homeric poetry is due to the economy enforced on it by oral modes of composition. Professor of English Literacy, Walter Ong, tells us, there was no use denying the now known fact that Homeric poems valued and somehow made capital of what later readers have been trained in principle to disvalue, namely the set phrase, the formula, the expected qualifier, to put it more bluntly, the cliche. The lineage of bardic poets that would eventually be conflated into the monomyth of Homer were known as rhapsodes. The word rhapsodize was used to describe the performance of oral epic and comes from the Greek rhapsoidos, meaning st to stitch the songs together. The weaver and the storyteller were both the stitchers of texts and textiles. To rhapsodize referred to the oral rhapsode's repertoire of stories and myths and epithets he could improvisationally stitch together into an epic particularly tailored to the needs of a specific time, audience, and context. Contrary to general belief, these epics were not memorized word for word. Rather, they were organismic. The traveling bard memorized the general episodes and characters and an ecology of epithets and standard phrases that, depending on the extra textual inspiration of audience and setting, were stitched together anew with each retelling. It is the reliance on set formulas, on disarticulated stitches of song and cliche, that allows oral poetry to migrate, change, and adapt without ossifying. Like Odysseus, washing up on the shores of strange lands, new places require new ways of telling your story. If you stick to the old version, you might anger an irrational despot or violate a set of mores. To stay alive, you had to be able to break down an epic to its memorable phrases and episodes, and then to stitch them back together again in such a careful way that the performance didn't get you killed and responded accurately to new circumstances. The rhapsode depended just as much on decomposition of stories as on the composition of stories. In fact, you can think of the traveling bard as being a traveling compost heap, able to alchemize and rot down popular themes and characters so that a new story could sprout for a new audience. Penelope's weaving and unweaving of the shroud mirrors the Homeric tradition. To rhapsodize is to stitch the songs together, to weave the text aisle. But to rhapsodize also allows and needs the unstitching of the songs, the unweaving of the songs that make, makes room for an opening, a new audience, and a new version of a familiar epic. It is fascinating to me that a lot of what we characterize as bad speech, as feminized speech, or bad literature, is what made oral narratives hardy, resilient, and rhetorically powerful. 
Heavy patterning, stock epithets, and communal fixed formulas helped knowledge travel. Repetition and cliches create a scaffolding around which a storyteller can improvise. Oral storytelling is paratactical. It acknowledges the connective tissue, the pauses, the places where the actual life world around the audience and the teller gets in, interrupts, and unweaves our expected outcomes. Network stories of episodes that all reflux into each other rather than one linear abstract narrative. The Iliad and the Odyssey, although they are heralded as heroic literature, reject the linearity of the hero's journey. Instead, the epics are composed like nested Russian dolls rather than as sequential episodes. This reflects the way biological life actually exists. There are no heroic individuals in the forest. The dynamic homeostasis of the earth is created by a series of nested biomes. Microbes live in your gut. You live inside a forest or an ecology or a desert. That landscape is nested into a greater environment that is in turn nested in the body of the world. In science, this tendency of parts to create a greater whole through a process of nesting is called holarchy. And it is true of the composition of many oral epics. They are composed through chiastic embrace. Episodic elements from the beginning of the epic repeated again at the end, closing the loop rather than punctuating the narrative line. Walter Ong explains that the Iliad is built like Chinese boxes. A poet could string together episodes, nest one episode in another, loop them together in ways that created a complex ecosystem of relationships rather than a straight arrow of causality. There was no true ending to an epic oral story. It was told over many different nights in many different places. It was always being told again, resurrected. The web was woven only to be unwoven. Like rhapsodes, fungi and bacteria compose and decompose material in order to generate the soil foundation of entire ecosystems. The decomposition process, the unweaving of minerals from stone, nutrients from dead wood, is just as important as the eventual regrowth of new vegetation. The unweaving of the web allows for an ecosystem instead of a shroud a fresh narrative instead of a dead end dogma. When I see a dead deer melting back into dust and mold and moss, I see the invisible handiwork of microscopic Penelopes, never allowing the text to finish, the ecosystem to halt its regenerative cycling. Myths have a root system in orality, in a rich inheritance of decomposition. They are built to break down, and then, after proper rotting, stitch back together, like fungi stitch back together the soil and entire forests. But what happens when you interrupt these biological and narrative cycles? My favorite example is the rich tradition of vegetal gods in the Mediterranean. Dionysus, Osiris, Attis, and Adonis are mushrooms that above ground look like individuals, but that are all rhizomatically connected to the same mythic mycelial system below ground. All these gods cycle in and out of growth, decay, regrowth, highlighting the biological and narrative necessity to weave and unweave in order to keep a story adapting to shifting needs. They arrive with fermented beverages, song, dance, vegetal anarchy, and then they die. Their bodies always mulched back into the very landscapes that initially gave them birth. Perhaps Dionysus is the best example of a mushroom connected below ground to a mycelial map. Dionysus always appears without warning, overnight throwing cities into disorder. And although archaeological evidence shows he is one of the oldest pre-Olympic gods, so before that Mount Terra explosion, first mentioned in Minoan Linear B, he is always personified as a stranger, as young, as new. He fruits up across the Mediterranean in different cities, always looking a little bit different, offering a variety of fermented beverages as suited to specific ecologies. 
but the real Dionysus is the mycorrhizal system of vegetal gods below ground, weaving a net that is ready to pop up and proliferate wherever nature-based ecstatic wisdom is needed. I have been thinking of textual myths as fruiting bodies. And when you have a fruiting body, you must ask where its roots are located. What is its mythic mycelium? Nowhere is this made clearer than in the case of the illiterate magician and storyteller known as Jesus or Yeshua. This illiterate nature-based magician has been deracinated from the ecology of Galilee. His body literally disappears, and unlike the vegetal gods of Osiris and Dionysus before him, his body does not go back to the land, to the forest floor, to nourish the fungi and complete the virtuous cycle. He is deracinated. And when his teachings are translated into Greek, the very language of his executioners, his nature-based Aramaic parables no longer make any sense. When Jesus said the mustard seed was like the kingdom, he was referring to the most pernicious and least favorite weed of Galilean farmers who are already struggling to grow the food to pay their taxes and keep hold of their land. So this is a very dangerous enemy. He was saying to his farmer friends, the kingdom is like an invasive weed that you have a very difficult relationship to and could cause your family to starve or die. <laughs> and it's already here, and it's in your fields, so watch out. Most of Jesus' teachings were intimately rooted in Galilean and Judean ecology and culture, but we lose the nuance when we translate him away from his actual body and his actual environment and his web of relationships. No wonder his teachings have been so easily perverted into simplistic dogma. Returning to myth as a symbiosis between people and place, I want to summon the fungal weavers, the ancient rhapsodes. When your wisdom is housed in vocalizations, the idea that knowledge is a relational verb, a weaving together rather than an isolated, isolated object is affirmed. Information is a verb that weaves a teller and an audience and an environment together. One syllable must decay in order to make room for the next. In fact, in oral tradition, the word permanence laughs at itself. The perma already evaporated by the time you can pronounce the nents. Life keeps moving, it keeps weaving and unweaving. Myth, when it is consciously created, can be a powerful way of coming back into dialogue with the polluted ecologies within which we find ourselves negotiating climate change and social upheaval. And yet, while it is important to reroute mythologies that have been deracinated from their original ecosystems, cultures, and modes of transmission, reclaiming their forgotten earth-based wisdom, we cannot return to the folk traditions of our distant ancestors. We cannot demonize writing and information technology. We can instead reclaim myth-telling as a way of asking our more than human network of allies for more feral suggestions on how to dismantle the dominant paradigms driving climate collapse. I want to offer that it is time to construct our personal and collective Noah's Ark of narrative. We need to decide what ecological information specific to our locations, what information about climate change and gardening, gardening and farming and lovemaking and ritual and music and survival we want to place in our arcs. Each person will have a different species they want to include. Each person will build a different boat with different words. Most likely our books and our computers will not survive what is to come and neither, neither may we. But our stories will ride the wind and sail the oceans. If we nest our vital information in compelling enough narratives, narratives with gods and romance and plants and high drama, they may be able to travel across stormy oceans for thousands of years to come. We might be able to remember them and tell them to someone else someday, able to transmit the memory of our flowers, our landscapes, our kin who have gone extinct. How do we create the narrative soil that will sprout these new stories, freshly adapted to our crisis? The myth-making we are called to do now is probably closer to something 
like composting. We live in a culture that is remarkably good at abstracting itself from the waste that it produces and offloading it onto marginalized communities that are the least responsible for its creation. We cannot simply decide that civilization and patriarchy are toxic and then reject them. Instead, we must take responsibility for our bad stories through the alchemical power of rot. On the compost heap, nothing is exiled. Beliefs and epistemologies that were never designed to touch combine inappropriately. <laughs> they um, ferment into soil that can grow something new to meet the demands of our dire circumstances. For our circumstances are dire, and we cannot keep letting mythic systems that we did not author continue to decide our narrative direction. We can no longer abide by stories that center heroic individuals and human concerns. Let us pour our heteronormative lovers into lichen, watching as they symbiotically fuse and forget their socialized genders. Let us turn King Arthur's round table into a pitcher plant, hosting and nourished by the excrement of an inquiline community of insects and invertebrates living within its tubular body. Let us coppice the hero's journey like an old tree, delighting when the cut trunk of an ossified narrative sprouts into many shoots and many possible stories. Let us turn linear narratives into convoluted food webs where one being's refuse becomes the sustenance of another's survival. While science and myth are seen as opposed, I want to propose that the tools of science have provided us with a unique window into the lives of the beings whose myths might save us. Inspired by the work of philosopher Isabel Stengers, I believe the most resilient thinking will occur in the overlap of disciplines, creating what Stengers calls an ecology of practices. We can return to the hybrid wisdom of the theriomorphs Symbiosis is the basis of life itself. Biological and mythic novelty arise from unruly compromises between species, epistemologies, and between beliefs. Let us lose our heads in order to gain our lion's minds. Let us tell narratives that like a mycelial system branch off simultaneously into a multiplicity of paths. Let us think with our entire mycorrhizal system of relationships. Let us step sideways out of the hero's human journey that by virtue of its linearity always progresses into extinction. Let us step into the survival of symbiotic multi-species myth-making. Thank you.